Welcome to week seven of Fundamentals of Biblical Interpretation. This week you're going to be reading three chapters in Ben Witherington's book, and I want to make sure that you leave enough time to read especially chapter nine. That's a pretty long chapter and it goes in a lot of detail, so you'll want to set some time aside to get through that. Chapter nine discusses hermeneutics. I wanted to be sure and say that word on the video in case you haven't heard it pronounced before. It's pronounced hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is what we call the study of interpretation. So you're familiar with talking about biblical interpretation and the study of how to do that, all of the discussions about good practices, bad practices, better practices, all of that falls under the, the word hermeneutics, in other words, the study of those, all the different approaches that we can bring when we try to interpret any text, but especially the Bible. Now, in chapter nine, Dr. Witherington lists seven principles of good hermeneutics. And I wanted to comment that I am less optimistic than Dr. Witherington is that these principles alone will bring us to proper interpretation. And so I want to remind you of Dr. Edwards' comments in the book that we read before this about putting love at the center of our interpretation, thinking about Jesus and Jesus' love and what Jesus teaches us about God's love and making sure that that is at the center of our interpretation. And also that we guard against interpretations and in particular applications that are oppressive. Now, about applications, I want to refer to you to the video that I have listed. Um, and it's a video I made about the ladder of abstraction. The ladder of abstraction helps us to answer the question of how to apply the Bible, knowing that we live in a culture that's different from the culture of the ancient world. And there are all kinds of issues that have come up over the years where Christians have struggled to figure out is the culture within which this Bible passage is being explained, is the culture normative for us? In other words, is this an element of the culture that we are supposed to imitate or is this an element of the culture that we should leave behind? Now the ladder of abstraction helps us to strip out some of those layers of culture and br bring us back to an application that fits into our time period and our culture, but it doesn't tell us how far away from the ancient culture we need to get. And so questions about what marriages looked like then and whether our marriages today are supposed to look like those. Questions about slavery, Certainly there have been Christians throughout history who have justified an ongoing practice of slavery based on the fact that there are biblical texts that say that slaves should obey their masters. And so some Christians have defended slavery on that basis and others have looked at the whole Bible and again looked at those texts through a lens of the love of God that Jesus teaches us and said no. The overall tenor of the Bible is one of love, is one of loving our brothers and sisters as ourselves, and therefore on that basis we can say that slavery is not a biblical principle, and slavery, certainly not race-based slavery, is not anything we should be applying or using or believing is somehow biblical today. Pain in childbirth is mentioned in Genesis 3.16. And when doctors first started giving ether to women in labor in the United Kingdom, there were pastors who wrote letters to the editor to say, no, 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 the Bible says women are supposed to have pain in childbirth. That is part of the consequence of Eve's sin. That is something that is necessary to women's salvation, that women should have pain during childbirth. And so doctors, you should not be doing that. That is sinful to take away women's pain in childbirth. Again, when we look at that interpretation through the lens of love, and again, the love that Jesus taught us, we recognize that no, if we have any methods to um, help people who are suffering, we ought to use them. 
1 Thessalonians 5.26, as well as several other verses, suggests that we greet one another with a holy kiss. The question comes up, is that something we should continue to do or not? 1 Corinthians 11 talks about head coverings. Are we supposed to follow that or not? Um, so all of those questions come up as we look at ancient cultures and as we look at our cultures today, and we always have to make decisions. And I think Dr. Edwards' suggestion that we make those decisions based on the law of love is an important interpretive principle that Dr. Witherington doesn't spend um, perhaps enough time with. Another thing that Dr. Edwards taught us is that we need to ask who benefits from any particular interpretation. And if we find that the people in society who benefit from an interpretation are people who already have more power than others in society, then we might rightly be suspicious about that particular interpretation and want to dig a little deeper and examine it further. In chapter 10, Dr. Witherington turns to biblical narratives. He talks in particular about the burning bush and that time when God reveals himself to Moses and gives Moses his name. So I thought an interesting thing for me to add to that chapter would be to talk a little bit about the names that we hear used for God, in particular the name Jehovah and the name Yahweh. I got curious as I saw those names used in various publications about why it is that some people said the name of God is Jehovah and some people said the name of God is Yahweh. And so I did some studying and here's what I came up with. If you have the name as it is written in Hebrew in front of you, that will be helpful as I talk about this section. The first thing to know is that Hebrew was originally and still often is written without vowels. And when the name of God is written, there it is written with four letters, four consonants, but one of them is repeated, so three different consonants. Hebrew is written from right to left, so if you look at the letter all the way on the right, it looks kind of like an apostrophe. That's the Hebrew letter Yod, and originally scholars thought that it was pronounced like a J, J. But today, scholars believe that in ancient times, it was pronounced like a Y, Y. The next letter is the letter He, and it's pronounced like an H. The next letter looks like a line with a little crook on the end, and that's a Vav. It was originally thought to be pronounced like a V, but now it's understood to be pronounced like a W. And then finally, the final letter is another He. So using just the consonants and early pronunciation, if we transpose these letters into English, we would get J-H-V-H. Now, the ancient Torah scrolls were written just with consonants, no vowels. But during the Middle Ages, a group of Jews called the Masoretes became concerned that the way that you pronounce these Hebrew words would get lost. This was partly because of the plagues that were going across um, Europe. It was also because many of the plagues were followed up by persecution of Jews and pogroms and the killing of the Jews. And there was concern that the people who knew how to pronounce the Torah scrolls would um, all die out and these pronunciations would be lost. Now, because these scrolls were already written with all consonants, there was no way to fit what we might understand in English as vowel letters in between the consonants. And so the Masoretes were really clever in that they came up with a system of adding um, vowels called pointing, where dots and lines were placed above and below the consonants in order to create the vowels and in order to help with pronunciations. However, when they came to the name of God, the name of God was not pronounced aloud. Instead of, of saying the name of God, the readers would say a word like Adonai, which means my Lord, or a word like Shema, which means the name. And so what the Masoretes did was they added vowels to the name of God, but they didn't add the vowels that would be used to pronounce that name. Instead, they added the vowels that would be used to say the word Adonai or to say the word Shema. 
And so when you see the, um, the thing that looks like a colon underneath the yod, when you see the thing that looks like a little t underneath the vav, when you see the dot above the vav, those are the vowels for another word, in this case Adonai, that were there to remind the readers, don't say the name of God, instead say Adonai. Because those vowels were there, however, at some point, non-Jewish scholars looked at that and said, oh, these must be the vowels for how to pronounce the name of God. They added those vowels to the consonants in the way that they thought to pronounce them, and they came up with Jehovah. Later, however, scholars realized that those were not the vowels of the name of God, and they I'm not sure how this happened, but they changed their ideas about how the consonants themselves were pronounced. And that's how you get Y-H-W-H and their best reconstruction of the name of God, which is Yahweh. I find that kind of thing fascinating. If you've followed along with me, thank you. Um, and now you know why in some texts and some people still will pronounce the name of God Jehovah and others will pronounce it Yahweh. Chapter 11 in Dr. Witherington's book is about the Psalms, and it talks about how to interpret the Psalms. Dr. Witherington goes into great detail in several of the Psalms, but I wanted to point you to a letter from a bishop in Africa in the fourth century. He was from Alexandria. He was bishop in Alexandria in Africa, and Bishop Athanasius wrote a letter to Marcellinus, who was sick. And in that letter, he talks about how to interpret the Psalms. And I've given you the letter, and he talks about how the whole Old Testament is contained in the Psalms. All of the stories of the Old Testament are referred to within the book of Psalms. He also points out that in the rest of the Old Testament, there are lots of psalms as well. There's the song of Hannah, there's the song of Miriam, and there's lots of other psalm, songs in other books of the Old Testament. And so therefore, not only does the book of Psalms in a sense contain all the books of the Old Testament, but it also kind of spreads out over the whole Old Testament. Then he goes on to say that the, in the rest of the Old Testament, as we read it, we see the stories of other people. And so we see other people reflected. But the Psalms are different. In the Psalms, he says we see ourselves reflected. And I want to read you just one sentence. He says, just as in a mirror, the movements of our own souls are reflected in the Psalms. And the words are indeed our very own given us to serve both as a reminder of our changes of condition and as a pattern and model for the amendment of our lives. He talks about the way the rest of the Bible tells us that we should bear difficult things with patience, and the Psalms give us words with which to do that. The rest of the Bible tells us that when we do evil, we should repent, and the Psalms give us words with which to repent. The rest of the Bible tells us that we should praise God, and the Psalms give us words with which to praise God. He says, just as Jesus came to earth and demonstrated in his life how we should live, that the Psalter, the whole book of Psalms together, gives us patterns of language for how we should speak in our lives and speak in our prayers. And then he goes through and he talks about all the different seasons and all the different needs that we might have in our life and lists various psalms that can be helpful and give us words to pray and to speak to ourselves, speak to our hearts during those times and uh, experiences. So I've given you a link to that letter if you're interested in going through that. Hopefully you'll enjoy your reading this week, and I will see you on the discussion boards. Thank you. Bye-bye.